Hi, everyone. Welcome to iConversations. I'm Sarah Gua, a general partner at Greylock. Today, I'm honored to welcome my friend, mentor, and former leader, Anil Basri. As an extraordinary triple threat of technologist, leader, and investor, he's the CEO, co-CEO, and co-founder of Workday. He's also a former managing partner at Greylock, and he really co-led Greylock's reinvention into a leading Silicon Valley-based software-focused venture firm. And he remains a valued advisory partner with us. At Greylock, he invested in entrepreneurs driving fundamental innovations in SaaS identity with Okta, flash storage with Pure, big data with Cloudera, and many others. Anil's the reason I'm in venture capital, having recruited me almost a decade ago, for which I am internally grateful, and he's the single leader whom I've seen most consistently focus on innovation and culture in my career. To everyone in the audience today, thank you so much for joining us. As we go through the discussion, please ask questions in the chat function on your screen. We'll try to get to as many as we can. I'm sure Anil's excited to hear from you. Anil, thanks so much for being here. I've been looking forward to this conversation, and I know the uh, entrepreneurs and experts have too. Let's dive in. great to be with you, Sarah. Yeah, let's have fun. Let's do it. So Workday is clearly one of the most important software companies of today. 75 billion of market cap, over 3 billion of subscription revenue en route to 10 billion, and 50% plus of the Fortune 500 as customers. A massive opportunity ahead in the office of the CFO, the CHRO, and not to mention international. Um, it's also a company that's committed to using its influence and resources for positive impact, but it's taken you, you know, a huge journey to get here. Um, I want to start by backing up a little. The company really exists today because of the relationship you and your co-founder, Dave Duffield, formed almost 30 years ago. Um, can you can you tell us a little bit about the beginning and how that led to where you are today? Uh, yeah, so uh, I met Dave in 1992. I was a summer intern at Norwest Venture Capital, uh, working with a guy named George Still, who continues to be a mentor and is on the, on the Workday board. And I didn't think much of it. And then as I was uh, finishing up school, I really liked Dave. Uh, I was going to move back to New York and, and go into venture capital. This was 1993. And I ran into George at a Burger King of all places. And he said, you know, go talk to Dave. And so I I talked to Dave. Uh, he took me out for beer. PeopleSoft was an emerging company at the time. It wasn't huge, but it was public. And, and Dave was Dave was a legend already. The fact that he took me out for a beer, uh, I, I immediately wanted to work for him. And I thought, hey, I'll learn a lot from this, this, uh, this great leader and, uh, you know, I'll do HR software for two to three years. I can't see doing HR software for that much longer. And 30 <laughs> years later, I'm still in HR software. And, but we started that friendship back then and we've been together now coming up on our 29th year. And, uh, I just feel very fortunate to have crossed paths with a great leader, a great human being, a great visionary entrepreneur at such a young age that. Uh, having him as a mentor definitely uh, shortened my learning curve in many areas. You uh, were working for Dave at PeopleSoft and you moved quickly up the ranks there. Um, what were some of the key learnings you said shortening the learning curve? Like what what did he teach you or what did you teach each other on, on the product front, the culture front? You know, I'd say a lot of it was about uh, about values and running a company based on on a set of values. And when you go back to the 90s, that wasn't a popular thing. Being a great place to work was not on everybody's radar. So Dave was pretty unique that way. He always led by example. At that time, everybody was talking about customer being uh, number one. And he said, no, employees are number one. And to this day, I remember his famous quote, and I use it all the time, never met a company that has happy customers and unhappy employees. It just doesn't work that way. If you don't have happy employees, you're not going to have happy customers. He focused in on uh, innovation, on having fun, on integrity, and we really ran the business on those values. And today, those are exactly the same values we have at Workday. It's changed because the world has changed so much in how, in how we use those values. But I learned a lot from him, uh, that perspective. The other part was, in the tech world, if you don't if you don't keep innovating, you ultimately become irrelevant. And so he was a relentless innovator and pushing and pushing and pushing and really the first CEO I'd worked for. And so, you know, as I've been uh, working with him and running Workday for the last 15 years and that same relentless push towards innovation and what you realize, the threats don't come from the other big companies. They come from that next startup that's going to create something from scratch that's going to be a leap ahead and you have to be on the, on the lookout for those kind of companies all the time. 
and make sure that you're thinking like a startup all the time. And that was one of the things about Dave. Dave always thinks like a startup CEO, even when we're running a huge company. So I'm, I'm sure this is not a um, favorite experience of yours, but it, it sounds like it was a formative one. You and Dave, you're innovators, you're, um, uh, you know, swallowed up by a, a company that is more of an incumbent, right? So, you know, what happened in the, the PeopleSoft Oracle acquisition and how did that change your thinking as a leader? Well, so uh, the way I got to Greylock was uh, in 1999, the, the board uh, and Dave came to the conclusion that, that the company needed a new CEO and, and Dave, just, Dave just was out of gas and didn't want to do it anymore. I was the heir apparent, but I wasn't ready. Uh, and I, in, in hindsight, I know I totally wasn't ready. So we went and got a CEO from the outside. And for the first three years, it worked just fine. This person drove higher levels of profitability. Uh, we were a better run company, but we started to lose our soul. And uh, we were not as focused on employees. We weren't as focused on customers, on innovation. You had a, you had a suite for executives. We never had that when when Dave and I were were at PeopleSoft. Fast forward to 2003, like a physical a, suite, like offices. Physical, or, yeah, yeah, offices, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Uh, <laughs> Strange concept. Dave and I yeah. sat in face to face cubes, and we've always sat in face to face cubes. Uh, and so, you know, the culture was changing. We buy a company called JD Edwards, and that and that causes Oracle to want to buy the the two companies, and they launch a hostile takeover. 18 months, the Department of Justice gets involved. Uh, towards the tail end, Dave and I are still on the board, but we're not running the company. We have, we've been out of the company for four years. I'm full-time at Greylock. Towards the end, the board uh, uh, fires that new CEO, asked Dave to come back as CEO, and, and Dave asked me to go with him. So I took a, a four-month leave from Greylock. And we did our best to keep the company independent. PeopleSoft was a great company, but we didn't, uh, we didn't prevail. But being back in that world, realized that, hey, we're going through the big shift. And we used to call that software as a service back then. Now everybody calls it cloud. Uh, but it was 2003, 2004, it was very early on. And you could see the PeopleSoft and SAP and Oracle customers struggling with on-premise software. A little company called Salesforce was beginning to get a lot of traction in CRM. And we thought, well, if PeopleSoft's going to survive, we're going to jump into this new world. We didn't get that chance. but. A few months later, uh, we we were able to start Workday, and so, at some level, grateful to Oracle and Larry Ellison because I think it would be <laughs> really really hard to start to to do the disruptive innovation we did from scratch, as you know, as a seven thousand person billion dollar revenue kind of company. It's much harder. As startup, we had nothing to lose, so we just went all in on on so software as a service. You joined Greylock in nineteen ninety nine. What drew you to investing? Uh, so I got there. And uh, um, the world was so consumer back in 99. And I try to invest in some consumer companies. Every time I invest in a consumer company, we lost a lot of money. And I thought, <laughs> I got to find, I got to, I got to bring somebody on who knows consumer. Dave was at Excited Home and uh, we were really good friends from business school. And I, I talked him into joining. And I think I've had a bigger impact on Greylock from hiring Dave Z than any of my own investments. The guy's the guy's a rock star, and we remain close to this day. But but uh, I, I was the one who actually recruited him, and the first few years were tough uh, because we were we were the two young West Coast partners in an East Coast firm competing against you know the same set of competitors. Other than Andreessen Horowitz, there's you know it's basically the same group: Sequoia, Benchmark, Excel, and they were all fully West Coast. And so that was the point we made the decision to, to become a West Coast firm. And um, if uh, I, I would say David Z would also um, suggest that his his early years were tough at Greylock and had the he had the mirror experience of yours where he's like I just I tried to be an enterprise guy and I tried to invest in virtualization infrastructure and it just didn't work <laughs> um, but, but it all worked out in the end. Um, uh, what you know was there was there a part of your brain or helping entrepreneurs with that fundamentally you you found attractive about investing as well. Well, the first thing is I love startups. Uh, just love being around the energy of entrepreneurs. I've, I've seen a lot just working with Dave in the early days of, of uh, PeopleSoft. And I think of myself as an entrepreneur, creating something from nothing is, is a really cool experience. And what I particularly liked was that initial go-to-market phase where you come up with a product, you need to map that product to the uh, requirements of the market. 
and you bring out that version one, if you get version one right, it's a whole different ball game than the people that iterate their way on version four or five to get it right. You just have a huge head start. And I really focused on working with those kinds of startups, which led me to work with a lot of technical founders, uh, folks that had a great product idea or technical idea, but wanted some help uh, shaping the business. And so uh, you know, that's really what, what attracted me attracted me to it. And so much so it's the reason when I got a chance to start Workday, I went off and did that because I just, I love that, that's that startup phase. Yeah. Um, it is that, that phase and working with some of those um, extraordinary product and technological technical founders is my favorite part too. Uh, your track record at Greylock includes incredible companies such as Okta and Pure and Cloudera. Um, besides being leading technologists, what are some of the main characteristics you look for in founders? Well, I'd say the leading technologist is is definitely the most important and sometimes overlooked. I'm I'm a big believer in Clay Christensen's uh, Innovator's Dilemma. Disruptive technologies come from below. If you're a startup with a product that's 10% better, it's not going to be good enough. I, I'm going to put aside consumer. I don't know consumer that well, but an enterprise, you've got to be 50, 80, 90% better than the legacy products. And that usually comes from an investment in in uh, in breakthrough technology, and that was data domain was the first one. Then Okta, PolyServe, uh, Pure Storage, Cloudera. They're all based on really hard to do technology. If it's easy to do, you can have a lot of competitors. If it's hard to do, and you and you break through, uh, you have a huge advantage. And then the second piece was about identifying big markets, and that's all. That's always uh, a tricky one because big markets don't present themselves. With the, with the poster sign say, we're a big market. Uh, but in the case of a data domain, backup backup was being done on on disk, on, on a tape, and you could say like, well, it's gonna be done at disk at some point, too expensive. Uh, the founder was a, 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 a Princeton professor, came up with an idea to compress data in a way that made the cost of disk the same as the cost of tape. But now you had all the benefits of having, having the, the data be on digital versus analog forms. And I think that changed everything in that market. And you're kind of always looking for that an enterprise, that replacement market. What, what product can I replace? What product or market can I replace if I get it right? You know, in the case of Workday, we're looking to replace SAP PeopleSoft Oracle. It's, it's generally a zero sum game in enterprise. So you got to figure out who you're going to replace if you're going to build a big company. When it comes down to the individuals, other than being technical founders, they, they, they had to be people that were value-based. That's one, the thing I learned from Dave. Uh, focus on integrity, focus on doing business the right way. As you know, startups are up and down. There's no straight to the right path for success. There's going to be tough times. And when they are, you got to rely on your values to get you through that. The loyalty of the team, uh, the commitment of the investors and everybody being on the same page to make it work. And if you don't have that, there's a good chance it falls apart. I'll notice. Um, I, I'll notice that you, you know, you don't really talk about uh, many of the skills that one might look for in a CEO over time when you think about founders, right? So let's say um, enterprise sales is probably the most obvious, uh, or distribution thinking, right? Um, or the um, you know, uh, executive ability to like communicate a vision, right? How do you think about uh, these founders that are extraordinary, but are not complete when you compare them to, for example, like, you know, you 30 years later as a C co-CEO? Yeah, well, I, I didn't have a lot of those experiences starting out. And when I look at, uh, when I look at a, a founder, do they have a compelling vision? Do they truly have a vision, not an idea, but a vision? Can they paint a picture of what their company and their product and their markets can look like over the next three to four or five years. That to me is number one by far. Uh, number two, do they attract great people? All those things like uh, like the revenue side, I've never been on the sales side, uh, but we've done okay on sales because I've, I've learned to identify top sales talent and then how to recruit them. And being that that recruiter is is really killer. And what goes along with all that for a founder is not just that compelling vision, but being a great communicator, you know, Steve Jobs set set the bar really high. But you look at a lot of the great entrepreneurs; if they're not great communicators at the start, they figure out that skill set. And so, I, I think you can hire a lot of skills out there if you can communicate a really compelling vision around a great product and and build a team around you. 
And so uh, there's nobody that comes pre-built to be a CEO, although I'd say that product vision is the most important thing to being a great CEO. When you think about the role that you as a venture um, investor or board member can play, uh, and as and then you know the other seat sitting as a founder, how you can get help in that all important goal of recruiting the best talent. Um, I was talking to Adam Aaron's, and he was like, "Well, you know, I I joined Okta because Anil told me to join Okta, and because I, you know, I just the Todd and Freddie, those are weird guys, but they were talented, and I I believed in the cloud, and I, I thought they had something, and they couldn't communicate it at the time, but it just it made sense. Like you know, the CEOs cared about passwords, and and Adam was like, "But really, like Anil told me to go there, and it was a good decision." <laughs> Um, he might be overstating that. He was a very, very, yeah, sorry. Very no, talented no, but, sales but, guy. Very I'm talented telling you, I, it, extraordinary, extraordinary needle mover for Okta. Um, how do you how do you think about how founders and, and uh, venture capitalists can team up to do that recruiting? You know, uh, it's been an interesting journey. Uh, by, by the nature of what founders do and entrepreneurs do, you have to be an optimist. There's just no way around it. The odds are generally stacked against you. Uh, the whole company is riding on your belief that you're going to solve this great problem and build a great company. And so you can't lose that optimism. And so you just you just go for it. You go for that brass ring. Venture capitalists, uh, what I learned as uh, you know as a as an investor, you try to provide the guardrail. So while the company is going for the grass for the brass ring, it doesn't go off the rails. And so you have to be somewhat of a uh, maybe not a cynic, but maybe maybe a skeptic. Ask all the hard questions. Constantly push the management team on. Uh, do you have the right strategy? Do we have the right business model? Most importantly, do we have the right team? The be the best teams don't win all the time, but they sure win a lot of the time. Uh, and so, that is probably where I learned the most um, as a CEO at Workdale. I learned so much from my time at Greylock about recognizing world class talent and constantly realizing that. It's not just a one and done. You've got to constantly bring in new talent. The person running sales at Workday in the early days was phenomenal. Uh, Mike Duffield, the person running it today is phenomenal. Doug Robinson, one person was optimized for 50 million of revenues. One person was optimized for 5 billion of revenues. It's just very different skill sets and you have to be very focused on that. And so I think the job of the venture capitalist is not, not to give answers, but to ask hard questions and at the end of the day, it's not to meddle in operations. Uh, it's be a sounding board for operations, but it's to push the CEO to do all the right things. And and so and so I, I learned to get, I allow myself to get pushed by the board more than I probably would have been comfortable with at Workday if I hadn't been through the venture capital experience because I realize I'm heads down. I'm very focused on what we're doing, and they have a, a broader perspective. And uh, and they all, they, we all want what's best for Workday. And so it's, it's made me a better CEO, just being able to listen to the, the advice of the outside uh, board members. For, for all of the entrepreneurs in the audience, you know, about, about a half my portfolio is enterprise and, it, you know, for enterprise and consumer, actually, um, many hope to someday do what you've done with Workday, uh, challenging extremely established legacy incumbents. Right. Um, what advice would you give to entrepreneurs facing that competitive dynamic? Um, first and foremost, come up with a product that really is disruptive, that solves a real need. It doesn't have to be the 100 percent solution up front for all customers, but it needs to be a 100 percent solution for some segment of the market. Uh, maybe it's medium customers, maybe it's in a particular industry, but come up with a compelling product. And for those first 25 or 30 customers, make them wildly successful because there's nothing that's more powerful in enterprise. Uh, you know, assuming you've got a great product, you've hired the right people, nothing more powerful than a happy customer. And I, I tease our salespeople all the time. I'd always take a happy customer over a great salesperson because a happy customer has got no agenda other than to say, I love this product and other customers want to hear that. And so getting that first wave of customers up and running and successful with the product, it's, it's worth everything. And I see historically uh, people miss that. They are so focused on the innovation, on the product, on selling more. That customer satisfaction sort of is a, something we deal with later. That is, that's a mistake. You got, you got to deal with customer satisfaction from day, day one and, and build it into your DNA. I think one, one thing that um, 
companies perhaps are missing right now is in in the race for growth and the sort of um, uh, extremely strong focus on year one, year two revenues. Uh, we actually have seen companies in the past that have gone to amazing year one, year two, year three revenues. But in in a SaaS business, right, you can even lock people into multi year contracts. If, if it's not valuable, it will eventually churn and your yeah. business will be in trouble. And, and I think that is actually a dynamic that we're beginning to see um, across across startups who don't have that focus that you described. Yeah. And, and if you stay close to your customers, they'll tell you what to build. They'll, they'll tell you what's missing. They'll tell you what what they really need to solve to solve their business issues. I remember in the early days at Workday, we were delivering this new HR system and a customer said, you know, we just need a better org chart. We're a big company. We don't even know where our people are. And we're like, okay, well, no one's brought that up before. <laughs> Ask all of our customers that, yeah, we'd love a better org chart. And so from very early on, we started working on, on an org chart and a flexible way to manage it. Um, but it, but if you're close with your customers, they will give you the, they will give you the roadmap. They won't come up with a new innovation, but they'll tell you what problems they have. And if you can solve their problems for them, you'll get, you'll get to be more and more valuable to them. One thing I hear from the the uh, founders and CEOs that I work with is concern about how to stay close to customers as they get larger, right? And how to make that a, a part of the culture of the company. Um, doing it when you're, you know, a 10 person team is is actually yeah. possible because you're like, well, you know, I and Neil, I'm going to go see every customer and they're going to have my cell phone number and we're going to talk and I'm going to understand that they want the org chart. Um, but as as our companies get to, a hundred and two hundred and a thousand or uh you know twenty thousand people that gets more challenging what have you done to try to keep the company close to customers well number one you you have to start leveraging technology uh, just to make sure that you're you're listening to all of your customers you're giving them tools to communicate all the customers uh from from number one to number three thousand uh we've i think we have like seven thousand eight thousand but on the hr side about three thousand they have my email. So if there's an issue, they're going to email me directly. And then I will figure out how to navigate Workday to get to get them an answer or get their problem solved. For that top group of customers that really drive Workday, maybe it's 10 to 15 percent, uh, we whack it up across the uh, executive uh, management team. So across about 10 people, we each have about 25 customers we check in with on a pretty regular basis. That gets us to about 10% of our, our base and ad hoc we'll check in with others, but that that's a good proxy for, hey, if we know what 10% of the largest customers are, are doing and how they're reacting to Workday, we'll probably have a pretty good sense. For the rest, um, it's using the tools and, and it's also the compensation plans. Uh, historically, we've always had part of everyone in the company's annual compensation tied to customer success. We measure it religiously. It's always been above 95%. And so when there are issues, they, they tend to surface pretty quickly because people know that we care. And if they're not getting an answer from our team, they, they uh, tend to escalate it pretty quickly. So so, so I guess the, the, the short answer, that was a longer answer than you probably want. The short answer is pay attention to your big customers or important, or, or you can't say important, they're all important, but big, bigger customers. That's where the problems arise. Use technology for the rest. And then for your employees, put in a... a you know, incentives that every employee in the company cares about customer satisfaction. So we're going to talk in detail about um, more about what makes Workday Workday and a transformational leader in enterprise software. Uh, before we do that, can you just um, orient us a little bit more about where the company is today and what the product lines are um, and, and your footprint? Uh, sure. So we are, um, uh, we are now, uh, almost 15,000 employees, pretty much in every major market in the US. Uh, we'll pass 5 billion in revenues this year uh, on our way to 10, which is our, our goal. Uh, uh, we started out as HR and HR was a really great place to start out a cloud company because it's an application that touches every employee. And a big part of cloud is having a much better user experience than traditional enterprise applications. So it was a natural place. We moved into fi finance and uh, from there, we've sort of developed a vision that we call plan, execute, analyze, and extend. And so uh, so we start out with HR and finance, and those are transactional applications. 
but we quickly realized that planning was a huge part of any any good business. You need a planning tool in front to inform you how you're going to execute, and then you need analysis tools on the back end to analyze the results, and you feed those results back into the planning cycle again. So, uh, so we plan with workday planning or workday adaptive planning. We execute with HR, finance, and now procurement. We analyze with Prism Analytics, and the idea is to have a closed loop so that, uh, especially when you, when you think about the world of, of COVID, the world was changing so rapidly. None of us knew what baseline business was. And so uh, the, the plans were literally changing almost every week. And the, the cool way we've built it is when the plan changes, it updates the transactional systems. You get the results, you get this model of continuous planning, which I think is the future of business. And the extend part is something we've introduced recently which is uh, letting customers add capabilities in the Workday platform that we're not building. So they can ex they can have that extensibility framework. But plan, execute, out, analyze is really what we're trying to do for that set of administrative applications, HR, finance, procurement, that, that naturally belong together. So uh, you started with this premise of, you know, software as a service, the cloud, right? Um, uh, you've since gone to um, plan, execute, analyze, extend, I think I heard. Um, uh, yep. This is a much broader vision than just people stop in the cloud, right? And so uh, were there were there one or two moments, like how did you arrive at the conclusion that we needed to extend the platform for our customers? Like what, what when did, was it from the very beginning, like we're gonna do fins or uh, was there were there certain moments that were inflection points for Workday's product thesis? You know, it, it again comes back to talking to customers. If I had to do it all over again, uh, after launching uh, the Workday HR applications or HCM, we we launched Workday uh, Core Accounting Financials. In hindsight, I would have done planning first because that's where the pain point was. So we go to these large companies and I said, yeah, at some point we want to replace our core accounting system with a cloud-based system, but right now we're struggling with planning. And so uh, Workday started off on building its own planning system realized we were too far behind the market, so we acquired Adaptive. We've since sewn Adaptive into the architecture, and so it's like a native application. Uh, but it really was listening to customers and recognizing that the pain point for the CFO office at the time was planning, not, not transactions. And now as we're going through post-COVID, the need for a next generation transactional system was really, was really, uh, uh, was really um, maybe lower priority five years ago is very high priority now. The analysis piece is the same thing. Customers would say how hard it was to get all their transactional data into yet another system that, uh, that they could analyze the results. And by the time they analyze the results, the data was, was stale. And so the way our analytics work is it comes pre-populated with the Workday uh, data model. It's based on, on Spark and, uh, and, and Hadoop and it allows you to just absorb a lot of data very quickly and get to sort of pre-configured pre -configured answers about what problems you're trying to solve. And so we, were, we just basically knocked down the problems that people felt were extensions of, of their transactional systems. And so uh, we're still in the office of the CFO, the office of the CHRO, uh, and that's the way we think about it. We think about it outside in, but what those offices need is now very different than what they needed a decade ago. Uh, like talent was not on the market, you know, was not on the radar 20 years ago of PeopleSoft. Uh, planning was not on the radar of CFOs 20 years ago. It's just an emerging category. And so the, the technology world's changed a lot, but so has the business world. It sounds like, um, you know, Workday is uh, living, listening to customers, but also living many of the, the changes that you want to support and, you know, provide software for in real time as a big company yourself. Uh, it's been an intense um, 18 months for everyone with uh, with Workday and all your customers having major adjustments to how they work. What did this look like at Workday? Um, and especially, you know, you have the two sides, right? You being at the center yeah. of the sort of yeah. crisis response for so many companies. Like, how did you how did you support your employees and customers and then rethink your planning process? We well, you know, fortunately, uh, beyond the Workday applications, almost everything else we ran were were native cloud applications. So uh, it was it was pretty easy for us to go to a remote uh, work model very quickly, and so we did. So uh, I remember we had a sales kickoff meeting in March of 2020. We decided we're not going to have that meeting. 
and the following week we said, okay, we're just going to go remote until COVID sorts itself out, maybe three or four months. <laughs> that was 18 months <laughs> ago. Uh, uh, I shouldn't laugh because it's really sad about how, how it's, how it's just devastated uh, so many lives and, and, um, you know, we're, we're hopefully coming through the end of it. So we're able to go to remote workforce largely because of the technologies that worked ahead and also, um, you know, using things like Zoom and WebEx, uh, Slack, Salesforce. We, we were basically a company that started, fortunately at the time, you know, Office 365, uh, uh, Google Apps, everything we ran was was uh, a cloud app. We were, we were fortunate we didn't really have any on-premise technology and that made it easy to snap into that world. And then it became all about trying to stay connected with employees and making sure that uh, we could all get our jobs done and take care of our customers in this in this remote workforce uh, uh, orientation. And I'm just super proud of the way the company responded and reacted. And uh, 2020 was a tougher year on demand side. 2021 has been a really good year so far. Uh, uh, without getting into our Q3 results yet, uh, but but Q1 and Q2 were very strong, and I think we just we figured it out. And if you were if you were a company that had the right uh, technology infrastructure, you could make uh, remote work work. The the hardest part were uh, the, the the two or three hardest things. How do you stay connected to your employees? Really hard. So we did a lot of uh, town hall meetings, a lot of uh, a lot of uh, virtual gatherings. We made big investments in um, mental health. We gave everybody early on in the pandemic two weeks of, of paid time off just to get ahead if they had any financial issues in their family. And now most recently we, we offer up uh, uh, Fridays off every month or so. We have a, a free Friday just so people can have a mental health day and catch up on, on life. And so we've tried to work that way. I'd say the hardest part is I thought I was a, an introvert, but even I like to be in the office and around people and I, we all miss that, you know, as we're coming back. What I'm also really proud of is how the company supported its customers and almost every pharmaceutical company, major retailer, they're all Workday customers. Many of the healthcare organizations are Workday customers. And our people stepped up to make sure that the people that were taking care of us could run their businesses effectively using Workday technology. So it's been a huge learning experience. I think we're gonna go into a work world that's not gonna be the same. I would like to get back in the office, but expectations have changed. And so I think the, the reality is a hybrid work, a work world is in front of us, uh, but there's, there's nothing to replace in-person collaboration, communications, energy. Uh, and so I hope we get back at least some of that. Yep. I mean, we're at, at Greylock, we're making huge investments on a future that is definitely hybrid, uh, but um, I'm also a, some part of it has got to be in person for me in terms yeah. of human connection. Um, uh, I, we have a bunch of questions coming in from the audience. I'm going to hold most of them, except for one that is, I think, relevant now, which is, um, how has COVID and work from home changed how your customers think about their people? You know, Workday's a, you know, a, a trusted advisor on talent strategy overall. What, yeah. what are you hearing from customers? Well, you know, uh, six, seven years ago, uh, I'm part of these CEO roundtables. One's the business council, one's the business roundtable. Not a lot of CEOs were asking me about talent. Say on top of every CEO's mind is their, their employee base, their talent. Number one, uh, they haven't seen them for several years in many, in many cases. And so they wanna get a sense of what's employee sentiment. How are they feeling about their job? How are they feeling about the company? Uh, uh, number two, it's a really hard hiring environment. Ironically, uh, you know, COVID has not had the economic impact on businesses the way people had expected it would. And so we're in the toughest hiring environment I've ever seen in, in 30 years. I've never seen anything like this. So mm -hmm. uh, the combination drives you towards uh, uh, first and foremost, making sure that the employees you have at the company are the happiest they can be. So this emerging area of employee engagement uh, popped up. We had some applications in there, but there was a best of breed company called Pecan that really me um, measures employee engagement uh, in, a, in a machine learning way. And that's been a very, uh, a very powerful application for us, but also a very powerful uh, talking point with, with CEOs and CHROs. Uh, and then the second piece is, how do you keep your best people at your company uh, from a skills perspective? 
And so it's all about continually training your employees with new skills, creating internal talent marketplaces so they can feel like they have mobility without having to leave the company. And so that, that's been a big, a big part of what's, of what's happened and what's really changed because of COVID. Number one, CEOs now are awakened to the point that, hey, if, if I'm not on top of where my top people are mindset wise, um, they're probably gonna leave. And number two, it's way easier to uh, add skills to existing employees and start from scratch with new employees. So I'm gonna invest heavily in my, in my current set of employees. Yeah, one thing um, I've I've certainly seen that uh, in, informed a um, an investment we recently made in in education technology, which is like you know kind of a bad word in venture traditionally, is if you compare the cost of um, recruiting and onboarding and retention of employees uh, in this labor market, um, where where I used to see leaders say like, well, you know, I I need that talent today, and it's just too costly to train people. I've seen a lot of a lot of leaders change their tune because they look at the actual costs and say, like, it's going to take me nine months to recruit yep. this person. Yep. Anyway. Um, so I think the, the right. core now, economic yeah. changed. I, I think education is now, uh, it, it, I don't know if you call it uh, corporate education or just call it uh, learning. Uh, yep. uh, but it is front and center. Not only does it take nine months to recruit that person, but when you lo lose a capable person in your company, they're usually been trained up for two to three years. They know how everything works at the company, not, not just whatever product they're working on or sales they're working on, but how the internal operations of the company works to get work done. A new hire not only has to, not only has to come on board and figure out their job, they have to figure out the company. And that, that's, so you're, you're saying nine months plus two years. So right. well, when you lose somebody, I think it's three years before you get somebody back in that same productive role. So, but, I, I think these education technologies are going to be huge and transformational, very much driven by machine learning, you know, telling people what they should learn to advance their careers, what people have done in the past to advance their careers who had similar backgrounds. And so I, I think it's, we're on to something really transformational that, that I think is all goodness, right? We're, we're, we're creating opportunities for people. It's, it's, uh, it's, what, it's what I like about enterprise technologies in general. Um, you know, our companies have souls. We're trying to make people's work lives better. We're not we're not trying to get them addicted to social media. <laughs> I, I had to stick that in there. I I I um I do want to come back to this point because you're one of the only CEOs I think that uses the word soul when you when you um you know talk about your own company and what you're trying to do. But maybe maybe we'll zoom out to just one, um, one, you know, one and a half last topics before we go to audience uh, and um, uh, our, our, our questions from the group. So leadership and impact, right? Uh, Co-CEOs, it's an unconventional choice, very uncommon. You've clearly succeeded and then doubled down on that model. How did you, how did you decide to do that? Uh, you know, with, with Dave and I, it was pretty natural. We've been together for 28 years. Uh, you, you know, we met when, when uh, you were at Goldman taking Workday Public. Uh, six months before going public, Dave and I had dinner and both of us decided we didn't want to be the CEO and went public. And the only model <laughs> we could come up with was co-CEO. Any of us wanted the job, came up with co-CEO. We did it together for three years, best three years of my working career. We had so much fun together. We had uh, facing cubes, but we're 26 years apart. We're not trying to be the other person. Um, I think of him as my mentor, uh, we're, we're best friends. It was a great experience. I then did seven years on my own. And, you know, enter enterprise er enterprise is complicated, both from the product side and, and the go to market side is, is super complicated, too. It's really hard as a CEO to be familiar to be facile in both. And so as we got to be a, uh, a larger and larger company, I felt like I was losing time on the products, which is my my interest and passion and knowledge because I was spending so much time on the go to market side, which was, which was not my set of skills that uh, splitting the job with someone that I totally trusted who had been with us for a long time, John Fernandez, who did have that sales background would, would make the company better uh, as long as we could check our egos at the door and, uh, you know, figure out how to focus on, on the things that made the company successful that we were best at uh, in, uh, individually. And it's worked really well, but you got to check the egos at the door. You got to have a tremendous amount of trust in that individual. 
there can't be competition. Uh, you know, that, that never ends well. Uh, but, but if you can make it work, two is way better than one. And, and enterprise companies, especially ones with large direct sales forces, high-end enterprise, it's like two businesses. It, it's not, you know, it's not a channel business. It's not a consumer business, nothing against consumer businesses that are selling ads, but the business side is just easier on the go-to-market side than it is on large enterprises. That's, that's a hard, that's a hard thing to solve. And, and we needed, we needed that focus and, and uh, we got it with Chano. Uh, on the flip side, you say, well, why don't you just have a sales oriented CEO? And, and I think that at that point you start, you start losing your focus on innovation. And so we, we need to keep both. Uh, how, when you have co-CEOs, um, how do you resolve disagreements? Um, you know, <laughs> resolve it with the same way with Chana did with Dave over the bar, ball of Chardonnay. So, so Dave and I would get together, uh, once a month for our Chardonnay dinners and, uh, we'd work through any issues. Dave and I've been together for 28 years. We've never had a fight. And I think part of it is we always had this way of let's sit down and talk through all the issues. Uh, and, uh, rarely do we get to a second bottle where we needed a second bottle. So usually one was enough. <laughs> we, we get, we get on the same page. It's all about listening. You have to listen to what the other person is, is saying, because there's in many cases, no right answer. It's about listening. Uh, so first seek to understand then to be understood. Uh, you know, it's a great, it's a great, uh, catchphrase from, uh, Stephen Covey's, um, you know, seven habits of successful people, whatever the name of that book was. And so that's, that's the way we, we work through it. And that's what I would do with Chano. Uh, it's a little tougher. He's in London and I'm in the U S now, but we're, we're very good friends. And we just make sure that we listen to each other first. And then, uh, you know, we, we try to make the best decision possible. It's not perfect. Um, uh, but, but if over time there's always give and take, as opposed to one person always making the decision that's happy for them, if it's give and take, it usually, it usually works out. So, uh, our, our entrepreneurs and execs, and I also had a bunch of questions about hiring, especially since, um, you, uh, seem to believe that, you know, team building both with, um, Dave and Chano and everybody else at Workday is, is the key to, is the key to success. Uh, you and Dave, um, and the team at Workday did something unconventional in that you said, you know, we're not just going to interview the first 10 people. Uh, we care about the first, we care about everyone, but like we are personally going to be involved in making decisions on the first 500. That's something that doesn't scale very well. Why did yeah. you do that? Uh, you know, uh, we weren't interviewing those first 500. And for me, it probably went on even longer uh, past 500. We weren't interviewing them for their skills. Uh, we assumed the team would get it right if they were a great marketing person or development person or salesperson. We were very focused on, uh, was this person a good fit from a values perspective? Because we knew if we got the first 500 right from a values fit perspective, you know, they were committed to the long run. Uh, they believed in our core values. They were not the shiny new penny people that were jumping from job to job. If we could sort that out up front, um, you know, we versus I, uh, that that 500 would then be empowered to hire the next 5,000. We never thought past 5,000, uh, but that 500, <laughs> a lot of them are still here and they're still uh, actively involved in recruiting. And they basically make sure, not that we hire the most talented people, but we hire the people that have, have similar value sets to us. Not saying that our value set is perfect, but it's our value set and people with similar values do well in the company. And you know, you mentioned the thing about having a soul, uh, it is important to me. We, we don't run this business for shareholders alone. Uh, I, I very much believe in stakeholder theory. Uh, I didn't call it that back then. I, I only realized that that's what we were doing. Um, you know, recently after Mark Benioff helped me understand what we were doing is stakeholder theory. But you take care of your employees, you take care of your customers, you take care of the community, you take care of uh, your business partners. You you make investments in in helping society be a better place, whether it's in diversity and and belonging whether it's in um uh you know sustainability and i think it's not just the right thing to do but it's a massive competitive advantage when you're hiring if you know this this new generation of people coming out of school they want they want to they want to be tied to a company that has a purpose beyond a high share price i i want to come back to that um in in a second uh but 
you talk about finding people who share the company's values and are aligned to the company's values. Um, how do you uh, how do you judge that? Right. Because um, many people like, you know, I, I think there's few people who'd be like, well, you know, I don't want to be a higher integrity, long term oriented team player. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, but how do you judge the difference between somebody who deeply believes that and will act that way and who can project it? Well, number one, you're going to learn uh, 80 percent about a person through reference calls than you are in an interview. So the interview is more just getting a sense of who that person is. Uh, number one, when you, uh, when you look at the resume, do they have a pattern of jumping every two years? And, and you know, that's a that's to me at least a yellow flag. Uh, that's a shiny new penny person that is constantly looking for that next new gig where they where they're going to jump to because great companies are built on people that stay at the company for eight, nine, ten years. All companies will tell you the same thing. So so filtering out those shiny new penny people, that's one. Uh, get people to talk about their experience and and uh, you know, people will default to being to being pretty transparent when they're in the middle of an interview, especially with two founders, to see whether they're I people versus we people. And uh, you, you know, you need to sort that out. We're a team oriented company. The I does not work well. We we need to have we people. Dave and I both have quirky senses of humor, so we crack jokes and we see if they laugh. That's probably not a good test, but we want to see if people would have fun. And and uh, you know. Um, uh, whether they, they, they wanted to, uh, to be in a place that might be slightly irreverent, and, and it was in the early days. As a, in terms of integrity and all those other things, you, you have to figure that out on the reference calls. That's impossible to figure out in an in a, in a interview, but you know, we, we were heavy in, in referencing all those folks in advance. The shiny new penny so piece and the I versus we were the two telltales. Yeah, and, and I think that's become more common than ever, just given the level of opportunity uh, yeah. in you know, Silicon Valley and, and um, the compensation and inflation that's happened in, in the industry today. Um, I want to go back to what you were just describing, which is stakeholder capitalism, and then also highlighting the fact that Workday's really excelled in an area where um, many companies struggled or or has made great strides relative to much of the industry, what, what you call vibe, right? Value, inclusion, belonging, and equity. Yeah. Um, You've had women in some of the most important and executive roles, so um, including, for example, Robin Cisco, um, and a workforce that is, you know, overall more representative of the community where it operates than many. Um, how how have you achieved that to date? And um, is it is it something the company has invested in over time? What can other CEOs be doing? Well, I think I think it starts with our value system. Uh, you know, from day one, we've had a very inclusive culture, and it's it's not been a, a bro culture. Uh, you know, half the management team has been female really since the very early days. And it's because they were the most qualified people for the job. And the, the key is that our value system and the way our company works, the right people uh, uh, filter up and get promoted into those roles. And so I'm, I'm very proud about our female representation in the company, our president, our, our, our CFO, our, our CIO, our CHRO, our chief marketing officer, um, you know, all female or head of customer services, which is a very male dominated role. Emily McKevely, also also female. So it's, it's about half. Uh, honestly, we have not done as well with underrepresented minorities. Uh, uh, you know, I'm I'm embarrassed. It's how low our numbers are. They're better than Silicon, than most Silicon Valley, but our numbers in Silicon Valley are embarrassing. Uh, and I think it's because we expected people to come find us and you know, that's that's not where all the diversity is. The diversity is all over the country. And so the way we're tackling it now is uh, hiring more in, in Atlanta and in New York, but also also training our employees to hire for diversity. I think that is really important because people tend to hire for people that look like themselves. And so uh, we're making progress. We've done it. We've done quite a bit over the last years, but it's creating a new mindset around uh, around uh, you know, as you mentioned, value, uh, value, inclusion, belonging, and equity, specifically for underrepresented minorities, where I think we all have to do a better job, and and uh, we we still have a long ways to go at Workday. 
So one last question on leadership, and then I'm hoping we can sneak in one or two from uh, the group here. Um, you've served on um, the boards of incredibly interesting platform companies like Intel, and most recently, you know, just joined the GM board. Um, you've, you were also a board member at, you know, Start to Scale for many Greylock companies. Um, how has being a board member at the largest companies informed your practice of, you know, being a CEO or, or being an investor? Well, you know, um, I've never run a company as big as Workday. Everybody says, you know, you and Dave <laughs> had the experience on PeopleSoft. We only got to 7,000 employees and a billion dollars in, in revenue, a billion and a half. Workday is 3x that size uh, from a revenue side. And so watching some of these big companies in action and, and seeing how they drive innovation, see how they manage their cultures at scale bigger than, than Workday is, is really, really valuable. Uh, with GM, it's, it's a fascinating company going through, uh, you know, I, I don't know, I don't know which is the bigger one. Is it, is uh, autonomous driving more important than uh, EV? In the short term, EV is going to change the world. And it's the biggest innovation since basically the combustion engine of the 1920s. So it's huge. And to be part of that with an amazing leader in Mary Barra, she just epitomizes that, that person who leads with the soul. Uh, she's, she is, uh, I, I put her and Doug and Doug McMillan as two of the best CEOs on the planet right now. Uh, they just, they, they lead, they lead with, they lead with, uh, values and, and just to see that at scale is pretty cool. But also I'm a, I'm a techie and, and watching, uh, I'd like to see GM be successful and see how, how I can help them be successful as they transition into being a tech company, every company in the world is going to be a tech company in the next 20 years. It's whether it's tech enabled or just pure tech. And so, um, so I'd like, I'd like to see GM be one of those successful ones. Uh, so here we are running out of time. I want to ask at least one personal question. How do you, how do you choose to spend your time beyond work day? Uh, as little as there is. Uh, well, I have two great daughters. I try to spend as much time with them and with my, my, uh, great wife, Allison, who you've met. Uh, and then golf and not much, not much more. Uh, I like, I like to play a lot of golf. Yeah. That's, that's, that's the thing that clears my head. Uh, it fits my engineering, uh, mind and, uh, and I, now I'm just trying to get the rest of my family into golf. And so that would be, that'd be, uh, <laughs> that'd be the winner. And, you know, I just spend time with, with friends and family. So, you know, those are hard comps, right? My family, golf, and work day. Um, <laughs> when, uh, when you choose to get involved in something that is a nonprofit or a charity, like what, what makes something worth um, being a part of or what makes something bubble up? Uh, it, 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 has to, it, has to, it has to grab your heart. You know, you got to say like, oh, they're doing something really neat that I'd like to be a part of. And so the, you know, the two ones I've probably been the most involved with are Year Up, which creates opportunities for uh, underprivileged youth who are, uh, you know, in that 16, 17, 18 year uh, age where they get an internship at work. Workday, the Workday Foundation is one of their biggest uh, supporters and, and I'm, uh, I'm and Allison are, are one of their biggest personal supporters too. And then uh, Eat, Learn, Play with, with Steph and Aisha Curry. During the pandemic, you know, Oakland got hit really hard. Uh, the kids count on their meals coming through the school and there was no school. And so very rapidly, Stephanie's foundation uh, filled, filled that void and served 20 million meals to kids during the pandemic. Just, just amazing. And, you know, that's right in our backyard. We need to take care of our, of our citizens and the our closer to home yeah. there, our community. Right. And uh, you know, I just got both excited about they're trying, they're trying to give uh, everybody equal opportunity. In the case of Steph and Aisha, uh, they're busy people. You know, Steph's probably the greatest basketball player on the planet right now. I'm biased. I think he is. Uh, he could wait until he's retired to want to have an impact, but he's having an impact at the prime of his career. I just have a ton of respect for that. So it's got to just got to tug you. There's no. You, you want to have a big impact, but it, it's got to it's got to catch you at you know at, at the at the you know heartstrings level, like the tugs on your heart, like ah. They're doing something I want yeah. to be a part of and, 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 and help. And childhood hunger is, is just something that, you know, that's a hard one. You know, it's a, it's a hard one not to just uh, get really sad about it. And it's something that can be solved. Yeah, I mean, I, I, uh, I, I really respect, as you said, like 
many people, they think like, I'm going to serialize this, right? I'm going to do my, I'm going to do my business. I'm going to use my skills and, and then I will figure out how to give back. And, um, if it's, uh, Steph and, um, and, uh, and eat, learn, play, um, or, or you with the work through Workday Foundation and your own personal pursuits. Um, I think that's, and, and stakeholder capitalism and the commitment to that. I, uh, I just really respect that. Um, let's, let's wrap it up with a lightning round. And then, um, maybe one question that I have to ask you because I need the advice. Um, so lightning round, quick questions. Uh, one, only one piece of advice for founders just starting out. They found product market fit. Now what? Hire great people. Okay. One, uh, personal change that you made during the pandemic. Exercise more. That's aspirational. Nice. I haven't yeah. done it. I'm doing it now. <laughs> we still have time. We still have months. Hope, uh, hopefully less, but months. Um, and the last book, podcast, piece of content, anything you'd recommend? Uh, Movie, bad Netflix show. Ted Lasso. Yeah, just, just the best show of all time. You know, I think about a great quote. Be curious, not judgmental. Uh, that, that's one of the great quotes from from that show, as, as is like the best animal to be after something bad happened is a goldfish because they have no memory. Be a goldfish. Yep. So, be a goldfish. Um, and then, uh, you know, I, I was I was really surprised how interested I was with that drive to survive Formula One, not because I'm, I'm a car guy, but just how uh, how into it people get and how athletic the drivers actually are. I thought that was fascinating. It was just a world I didn't know. And, you know, without the pandemic, I wouldn't have had time to sit down and binge watch that. I'll, I'll put it in the queue. Okay. Um, and then the last question, which I had to ask, and but also came from an entrepreneur in, in our group, uh, Workday recognized and, and rode the shift to cloud. What is, uh, you know, what are the macro trends you think founders should be paying attention to today? Well, I, I think it's very clear that the, the next wave is all about the data. Uh, and one of the beauties of the cloud is that the data is captured in a normalized way. When you think about on-premise applications, everybody customized them. The data was not centralized. Uh, the, the cloud is the perfect platform for machine learning and, and AI. And uh, if I were starting Workday today, I would start it uh, with, a, with a machine learning AI approach first. Like what, what insight was I trying to give my customer out of these applications and work my way backward to what what processes I need to automate to get that insight to them because I think over time uh, automation is is commoditized and it's all about insight and um, and if I were if I were somebody that was about to go to college I I go in and want to be a data scientist not a computer programmer. Oh, this is strong way short, way short. Every company I'm involved with is way short on on data scientists and, and it's going to be that way for a long time well we've come to the end of our session um anil thank you again so much for your time and insight and your longtime support for me and for Greylock. i always learn so much from you i appreciate it thank you to our audience we hope you enjoyed today's i conversations uh please keep an eye out for our email survey about the event we're here to serve the community and looking for ways to improve and we hope to see you at our session uh, in a couple of weeks my colleague David Thacker will be interviewing YouTube's um, Chief Product Officer Neil Mohan about how he thinks about the future of the web's uh, second most visited destination. Anil, thank you again. Thank you, Sarah. Fun to be with you.